The first thing that you should do is to reassess the survey that's been done by CCC Incorporated. Um, if you see a set of 10 replicates, the first thing that you should think of doing is to take not just the mean but also the standard error. Um, and that's what you should do with your data. So, first of all, work out the mean. Standard deviation. And then the confidence limit, which is from the standard error multiplied by uh, t. To get the standard error, we take the standard deviation and we divide it by the square root of the number in the sample. The number in the sample is 10. The square root 0.5. And then we need to multiply all of that. I T value you're working at 0 0.05 probability and there's nine degrees of freedom. So we've got a confidence limit of four point six on a mean of forty nine. And we can do that for the two thousand and two survey data as well. From that, though the mean is less than 1.75, they said actually that uh, there's no problem with the site. You recognise that they've probably said that because the mean's less than 1.75, but if you include the 95% confidence limit, then it's as high as 2.08. You might also be unhappy with the fact that of these values, some of them are above 1.75. There's 2.29, 1.99, 1.84, 2.79. Um, but the statistic also shows with a 95% confidence that um, it exceeds the standard value of 1.75. The guideline itself is also ambiguous as there's no vertical position um, specified for the sampling. Um, doesn't say whether it's surface soil or soil at some depth or it, um, an amalgamation of soil over um, a specific depth. This is compounded by the fact that the reported methodology from CCC Inc. doesn't give you any information about the depth at which the samples were taken. So given the mistakes in the interpretation, which there clearly are mistakes, uh, and the ambiguity of the survey, it's appropriate to actually go ahead and use the compartmental model that's already been justified um, in order to predict the PA concentrations with some degree of vertical resolution. That does seem to be necessary. So we don't need to explain the model, you know that, and we're taking it that's been explained to the clients already by PEA, though they didn't use the model. What we're actually going to do though, um, we need to run the model perhaps four times because the input parameters um, aren't fixed. We've got this key transfer coefficient between the compartments which varies between 0.05 and 0.27. Also the starting concentration uh, if we take it from um, the starting concentrations where we've measured the mean and the standard error then we've got the starting concentration which varies between 49 plus 4.6 and 49 minus 4.6 so we've got an upper and lower value for the starting concentration and we've also got upper and lower values for this transfer coefficient. So that gives us four model runs. So we need to vary the starting concentration between 53.6 and 44.4 um, and the transfer coefficient between 0 0.05 and 0.27. Those potentially within those scenarios we will have recognized 
the best and worst case. Subsequent to that, we also need to verify the numerical solution um, and so we'll need to run the model four times and then four times again but with a shorter time step. So that's what these columns are set up for. The time step of one year here and the time step of half a year here. So the formulas that we need to fill in are the storage equations which are the same as the ones that you derived for your um, greenhouse gas emissions example. So if we click on these, the cells are named again. Um, the formula that we've got, B21 is the starting concentration, either the concentration from the previous year, plus the flux in, which is this, minus the fluxes out, and the fluxes out are calculated from the transfer co coefficients multiplied by the concentration in the compartment. That's why B21 features again. There's two fluxes out, one here and one transfer into the other compartment. And then these fluxes need to be multiplied by the time for which they go on, which is the time step. And the time step in this case is one, and in the verification example the time step will be a half. And then compartment two same starting concentration C21 plus the fluxes going in which there are two which are the flux coming from compartment one and the flux coming from outside into compartment two minus the flux going out which is um, calculated from the transfer coefficient and the concentration in compartment two Again, the fluxes are multiplied by the time step, which again in this case is one year. And we've put a column on here which is to give you the mean. So it's just two of these numbers divided by two. So we've got a dredgings concentration, a soil concentration, and a mean concentration. You can copy those down. And graphs appear. We can do the same thing for the verification. Verification is going to require us to look at the final values and compare those here we've effectively got zero, it's e to the minus six, so a tiny number and here 1.32 compared to 1.34 concentration um, and say that given the variability of the input data the amount of variation the difference between using a one year time step and a half year time step in this case is insignificant and therefore we're happy with this time step we're happy with the one year time step there's no requirement to run a smaller time step you need to run model with different starting concentration we've got 53.6 or 44.4 and you also change the transfer coefficient between 0 0.05 and 0 0.27 you can see that the graphs change shape quite radically and what we're interested in is when the concentration falls below the acceptable concentration of 1.75. We could present these results which would encompass the best and worst case scenarios by changing the starting concentrations and the transfer coefficient. However, we've recognized that the survey itself is ambiguous um, and because we're, we're not sure what samples are actually taken by CCC Inc and there is also the ambiguity about what the standard relates to the 1.75 um, milligram per kilogram concentration whether that relates to the surface soil or throughout the soil um, or anywhere within the soil profile we can be more intelligent in coming up with the final recommendations that we might make it's only 
and one of the scenarios that we've actually tried out that um, is there any match between the values measured in 2002 and those predicted in 2002 and that condition is when the transfer coefficient is 0.27 only when the transfer coefficient is 0.27 do we end up with anything that approaches the concentrations that were measured in the 2002 survey. If we change this back to 0.05 then in 2002 we've got 15 and a half and nearly 13 whether it's in compartment 1 or compartment 2 whereas the measurements made were had an average of 1.6 so this strongly suggests that two things one that the CCC ink survey could only have been a survey of the surface soil which does seem to fit with their approach of not even recognizing the variability in their 10 samples um, but it also um, allows us to calibrate the model and we can recognize that this previously um, not well constrained transfer coefficient as it varied between 0 0.05 and 0 0.27 from work that was done in the laboratory um, is actually much closer to 0 0.27 0 0.27 does produce values that are at least in the right range of these measured values you can actually specifically make an effort to calibrate uh, the model because we do actually have um, observed and predicted data we've got the observations made in 2002 and the predictions drawn from uh, a model that ran from 1992 and this is an excellent opportunity because the transfer coefficient was difficult to constrain and effectively there's been a field experiment carried out over 10 years and we should take advantage of that in order to constrain the transfer coefficient. The maximum value of the transfer coefficient can be found by inputting the upper limit of the starting concentration and adjusting K until the concentration in the dredgings after 10 years becomes the lower limit of the observed data. So if we put in the upper value of 53.6 and we're aiming to produce a concentration in the surface the X1 compartment of 1.645 minus 1. minus 0.44 so 1.61 to get 1.61 the compartment we're looking at is this one we just reduce the transfer coefficient to make the concentration a bit higher um, 0 0.24 0 0.245 we've got 1.62 there's no point fiddling around um, beyond really two or three decimal places but we've constrained that transfer coefficient to be much closer uh, to the 0.27 end which we know for sure and actually it's a little less than that 0 0.245 um, and if we were to put in the lower concentration of 44.4 and we have about 0.23 and you, you can adjust that yourselves to get it as close as you like um, so we can have a transfer coefficient that we can constrain them between two values and that uh, range that we're constraining to is much much better than the original range
of 0.05 to 0.27. So of the four scenarios that we originally produced, we can actually narrow them down. Um, only those scenarios where we have the transfer coefficient of around 0.7 seem appropriate. Um, from those you can work out the year or the range of years uh, before development could proceed. It's going to be 21 14 to 21 24 somewhere around those depending on uh, how tightly you constrained this transfer coefficient um, and that's if we assume that the the legislation is taken to mean the average PEA concentration the long period of decay is primarily for this PEA uh, in the lower soil the concentration of which exceeds guidelines for access for between well, around 40 years, 40 or 45 years. Um, these very high concentrations in the lower soil occur within three years, regardless of the variation in starting concentration. Uh, the concentration in the upper dredging is below guidelines soon after 10 years. So the problem really is the, the deeper soil and it's still ambiguous as to whether that actually matters. Um, However, if the concentration in the deeper soil, or in fact the average concentration throughout the soil profile, is what the legislation does refer to, then um, there's an immediate requirement to, to limit access to the site because the concentration is actually likely to be over 20 milligrams a kilogram, um, though that's not apparent from the CCC ink work. So the recommendations then be in order to reduce the uncertainty in the prediction of average concentration it would be better to invest in a more extensive survey of the site rather than anything else. Um, there's not really any need to do further laboratory work to constrain K because this 10 year field study has done that better than it could be done in a laboratory. Uh, but the variability in concentration across the site is well worth uh, investing a bit more uh, resource into. The improved survey could more tightly constrain an input concentration which is where the error is coming in now um, and that would actually further improve the calibration of K as well. The uncertainty over the time taken for the average PA concentration to try into guideline levels is not significant compared to the ambiguity concerning the application of the guideline itself. So with the work that you've been able to do, the uncertainty over the time taken um, using the model uh, isn't significant. Um, you're able to pin that down quite well, but the biggest uncertainty is what do we actually mean with that legislation. Um, consequently, consideration of the guideline values with respect to the operations we carried out on the site should be the priority for further work. That needs to be addressed what do the guidelines actually mean and it's recommended then that access to the area be controlled immediately uh, and until the further guidance has been received because the PA concentrations in the deeper soil are extreme they are above 20 milligrams a kilogram. A similar point but not as a recommendation to the client is um, just to consider um, the confidence level that we've been using working at 95% confidence so the distribution of concentrations across the site um, we worked out what the standard error was um, and the confidence limit drawn at 95% confidence and th that's something that you might want to consider uh, you know if we were to make a hundred measurements and all of them were well below the guideline value but one of them was above um, the confidence limit might also mean that it's below guideline but we have got one sample above and how do we deal with that way of dealing with that is to change the confidence level that we work at if we were to make it 99 or 99.99 percent then a single value in uh, 20 or 30 um, could bring us over the limit um, and that's certainly one of the things to consider when we work in doing our scientific experiments at the university we work at 95 percent confidence What's the confidence level that you might work at when it comes to human health?